It's a time-honored tradition, passed down from generations. And even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, we can do our part today. To ensure the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Join today and help us ensure the future. Well, welcome to episode number 31. A little bit of your life according to Flint. Happy to welcome an old friend of mine, longtime friend, not old friend. He is the former, I never know what the title was, media guy, head writer for PBR. He is uh, media guy. Media guy. It was editorial director and senior writer for PBR, but I like media guy. I like media guy. And how about Flat Keith Shivers at one time? And El Diablo himself. There you go. My this friend. I have a lot of names and a lot of titles. Elton John, whatever you whatever you want to say. I'm my friend Keith Ryan Cartwright. It's mostly it's good to see you, buddy. I, we don't talk enough. We don't, and it's good to see you. And I'm um, thankful for you to um, invite me on your show. And and um, man, it's never an interview. Whether you're the one talking to me or I'm talking to you, it it mm-hmm. it. It just always just becomes kind of a a conversation. That's funny you say that. Before we started, Logan, who runs all the equipment here, before we went on the air, I said, you know, I do do quite a bit of prep for all these, uh, you know, coming in cold, uh, uh, an order I want to go. And I said to him, I didn't prep as much for this because we've interviewed so much. Whether you interviewing me, me interviewing you, we know where we're going. (laughs) Like, it's just kind of in front of us. So... It's relaxing. I think both of us know what the other needs when you're, when that person is the quote unquote interviewer. And, and it's just, it's just a kind of a free flowing conversation and, and, um, and hopefully it's, it's entertaining and insightful to, to, well, as insightful as As, I can be. Likewise. And as you being a native of Wisconsin or Wisconsin, as we like to say, I did this for you. I, this was a conscious, I don't know that I've ever worn this shirt till today. Green Bay Packers, man. It was between this and my beautiful replica Mitchell and Ness, uh, Ray Nitschke road white jersey from 1966, I think. Beautiful. Wow. It's beautiful. It's a work of art. It, uh, those old jerseys, they really are. And um, boy, I think it was 2000 six or seven at the Tennessee state fair. This is like a year, year and a half before I started working with the PBR. Um, I went to the Tennessee state fair and there was a, uh, a, a, a ski ball game and hanging up was a Bart star Jersey. And I thought, man, I gotta be the only person at the state fair who wants that Bart star Jersey. And I, dude, I spent four hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> trying to win enough tickets to turn uh, them in to get the jacket. It got to a point where all my friends are like saying, "Dude, you need to you need to stop. You've overpaid for the jersey already, and you're nowhere near it." And um, and they begged the guy, "Look, you you've taken four hundred and fifty bucks out of this this guy's pocket, and he's not going to stop until he get, has enough to get the, <laughs> the shirt." would you give it to him? And, and the, and the prick never gave it to me. Like <laughs> no I kidding. literally left without the Jersey. And you could have just bought one. Could have just could have bought it for less. You can't beat a number 15 Bart star. So no. you, you and I and our, our uh, Packers and we will get to the topic at hand, but our Packers stories, you've shared Brett Favre stories. Some you can share with the public. Some you can't, some but can. I, I just, Brett Favre, he was uh, speaking of Packers. What a personality, like a, a unique, that's why he was such a big contributor to the game in general, because he was just such a, uh, such a unique personality in the world of what the league was. That, absolutely. And, and to, to illustrate that personality, um, uh, back before, again, before my PBR days, well, when I, when I was spending $450 on ski ball, I was producing and writing television shows and I was working on a show for, uh, 
for CMT counting down the 20 greatest moments of Hank Williams Jr. career. And uh, one of the, so you count down all the moments and you have the talking heads and whatever. And one of the guys that we interviewed was, was Brett Favre because I happen to know through another friend of mine that Brett and, and Hank were really good friends. And so I had no problem flying up to Green Bay and um, we're going to do this interview with Brett at Lambeau Field in the, in the office area. Huh. And so I have a local crew. They set up the camera and the backdrop and everything. And, and they tell me Brett's going to be coming down the, the hall. He'll be in in a minute. And um, I had the door open. And so I'm kind of waiting by the door and looking down the hall because I'm going to greet him when he comes. And all of a sudden he turns the corner and he's walking down the hall toward me. I mean, he looked like Elmer Fudd. He had the winter sorrel boots on. His jeans were tucked in the in the boots. He had a flannel shirt. He had a ball cap on, and he was carrying a, a double barrel side by side shotgun, and it was kind of broke, cracked open. And he's walking down the hall, and I said, "Man, ni- you know, nice to meet you." Da 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 da. I go, uh, "I'm not a violent guy. There's there's no wor- You know, I'm not going to attack you or anything." Why? What's with the gun? Why'd you have to bring a gun? And he goes, oh, no, no, no. I got a great Hank Jr. story. And I said, yeah, we probably could have told it without the, I don't think he needed the gun. And um, and so, yeah, he, he had gotten a gift from Hank Jr. Gave him this uh, double barrel shotgun as a gift. And, uh, and Brett wanted to, we never even showed it on, the show because yeah. it's, obviously it's not one of the moments or whatever we're <clears throat> talking to him about other other things and he never really even got to talk about the gun but that was the day that brett showed up to my interview um <laughs> with, a, with a shotgun uh speaking of interviews material i appreciate that you staged all of those leather bound books behind you <laughs> no those your, are mine. your apartment smells of old mahogany uh, <laughs> yeah, because the topic at hand coming out Monday, November 1st, excited for you, by the way, my friend, uh, I got to put my bl- uh, glasses on. There it is. I was hoping you'd have a copy. I do. Black Cowboys of Rodeo, unsung heroes from Harlem to Hollywood and the American West. First of all, congratulations. I mean, Thank you. What, you always have been a great storyteller, whether it, uh, face to face like this in your writing it was kind of that next step. Uh, it, it was the next step. Didn't you tell me that Justin McBride at one time said, your next thing is writing a book. It came it, from him. More than one time. I mean, yeah. Ty Murray led me down the path that led to the Black Cowboy book. But it was Justin McBride every time I was talking about, man, what is what am I going to do next? Like, what is next to my career? And he would always just say, Diablo books, man. I'm telling you, you're an author. You need to be, it's time to be an author. And, and, um, eventually, um, when someone like that is is repeatedly telling you, I see you as an author, you are an author. It's time to become an author. You, uh, you eventually kind of, kind of follow that lead. Hey, I want to, I think I should point this out. And now there might be people listening on, oh, great, a world champion bull rider's telling you you need to write a book. Great. Justin McBride's a unique cat. He is well-read. He always has a book, always is reading. So he knew, when you say Justin McBride, he knew what he was talking about. The well, guys are you, like, speaking of unique personalities. Absolutely. And, and much like you, Beyond your podcast, beyond any articles that I would have written about you, you and I had a lot of conversations. It's probably why the interviews are never interviews. They're conversation. Yeah. You know, um, McBride and I, over the years, have had hundreds of hours of conversations. You know, and it's largely me trying to really figure out what what is it that makes a world champion? I mean, it's one thing to compete and know how to compete. It's another thing to inherently know how to win. 
how to put your foot on the opponent's throat at the at the exact time that you need to to assure victory and and um and those are conversations that i loved having with him they used to be at three in the morning and now they're at three in the afternoon (laughs) okay before we move on though because i've said it and you just said it diablo you you even just included it you got to tell us before we go on where the uh the diablo that although a lot of the writers called you diablo where'd that come from well, it, it came from Adriano, <laughs> and I don't think he meant it as a compliment. No, I, I don't think he did. I don't think he meant it. He did not mean it as a compliment. So you got to go all the way back to when Silvano Alves first came to the United States. And, he, and I don't know how many bulls in a row he rode when he first got here. But he rode a bunch of them, and he won a handful of events to begin his career in, a, in America. And I wrote an article and it was a glowing article about everything he was doing. And I think there was a a misunderstanding between a line, one little line that I wrote in the article, what I intended with it and what Adriano thought I was saying. And I wrote, and I was merely saying the one thing we haven't seen from him is that he can ride a bull marked 45 points. Because at that point, not, none of those bulls had been marked 45 right. points or above. He had ridden in the short round, but they were 44s, 44 and a half. And I wasn't meaning he can't and we won't see it. I meant, I was like, all these things he had done, I was actually letting people know one mm-hmm. more thing for us to keep an eye out. Like, we haven't seen it all from him. This is... And, Adriano took it as, as uh, that it was negative, and and he called up uh, Sean Gleason, and and he he wanted me he wanted me fired. Oh and, wow! Uh, and said wow. it was said what I wrote was bullshit. To that I couldn't just compliment the kid; that I had to knock him, and I wasn't knocking him. I I was I was saying I, w- I meant it in a way in which there was more to come. Like yeah, there's he's. He is good enough. Now we can look for that. I didn't mean we aren't going to see it. And then when Sean kind of laughed and said, dude, I can't, I'm not going to fire the guy. Are you kidding? And then, and then the Diablo came because he then said, my words and my work were the word were the words of the devil. <laughs> and so then they named you Diablo. And then McBride heard about it. <laughs> oh, and God. The, the, the World Cup. This was all in, leading up to the world that World Cup. Yeah, and um, and because that was like the third, second, or third event Silvano went to, and so um, Adriano told the Brazilians, "When we get to the World Cup, you you are not allowed to talk to to Cartwright. We're not doing any interviews with him. You can we're we're, we're avoiding him. It was because he didn't he didn't like that he didn't like that line, and then." Obviously, Galarmi and, and Robson giggled about it. And I, I interviewed everybody for the whole weekend. And, you know, we got past it. And it, it, it's interesting. Like, he and I, as in, I mean, and he being Adriano, we've had some of my, some, some great conversations I had with him. You know, we're both deaf in one ear. Oh. Mine was, <laughs> mine, uh, I was born with. And, <clears throat> and it, just progressively got worse. Yeah. And he lost his hearing in one year from a shotgun blast. I didn't know that. I didn't. My second shotgun story of the <laughs> second two in the first 15 minutes. That's a record. Yeah. yeah. Well, Hey, so uh, we have things in common and we talk about what that, what that's like and how, when you hear out of one ear, you know, I, I, well, I will, I can't hear out of, I'm at this point, I've, even forgotten but yeah. it's the right ear that i or the the right ear i can't hear out of so it was the left ear that was my better ear and so you spend your life turning around <laughs> to the if you think everything is coming from that direction and you spin all the way around to your <laughs> looking to what was your your right um but my girls yeah, have we, my girls have a dog with one eye similar similar there you go. um well you so know Cody you, Lander has a dog that can't even see well there you go he's lucky he doesn't have a look at cody every time but you know it's funny and now now 
to switch gears again, but Adriano, uh, he and I had a, a, one of those confrontations once about something I said, and it was a little bit lost in translation where he, he and his wife didn't understand sarcasm. And I made a right. comment in the arena where it, it was about Brazilians. They should be like soccer, soccer players and run around and with their Jersey. And I didn't say that's what they did. It, it was lost in the translation, yep. and that happens a lot. That's We forget that with the Brazilians. I've learned now to be real straightforward with what I want to portray to them because yep. I learned it really bothered me. It More than 12 hours, it bothered me. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and I learned that, that, like, I think sarcasm is an American thing because yeah. I was the tour manager for a rock and roll band from Sweden, and they did not get – sarcasm and it took me half the tour to figure out the reason they were progressively hating my guts was because they were not finding any of my humor funny because <laughs> they didn't understand sarcasm oh. they thought i was being the dick and it wasn't abba right not abba, it was not ABBA. no it was that, of Vienna. for what it's worth the story would have been better if it was abba because well, you're my it. dancing queen keith you're my <laughs> Okay, back to your book, <clears throat> Black Cowboys, not just, not the exact title, but Rodeo, Harlem to Hollywood, which means, you know, Hollywood, movies, the American West. The American West part, in my interest in history, is the part that I, I guess sparks my interest the most because I don't think the role of Black Cowboys is portrayed at all in History books, the Old West. Am I right in saying a, a very larger, much larger percentage of those cowboys on cattle drives working at ranches were black cowboys? Correct. Yeah, you're gonna hear you're gonna hear a lot of people reference now more than ever before that one in four cowboys in the Old West were black. In truth. One in four cowboys in the old west were minorities. Okay. So let's not recognize one minority at the exclusion of the other minorities. Now, the vast majority of those minorities were black cowboys, you know. And uh and yeah, they played a they played a huge role. But you know, you were you were you were a teacher and you spent, you know few decades traveling around the country and you've met people all over uh from coast to coast by and large i'm a writer pains me to say this many many americans do not enjoy reading so we we visualize we have to see our history and if we don't see it happen it didn't happen right. and unfortunately when hollywood popularized the western both movies and then television uh, it was first during segregation and then during the height of the civil rights movement and television executives and, and moody, movie studio executives did not, quite frankly, have the courage to put a black man on a horse and call him a hero. So uh, basically at, at the, the era in which movies were coming out, the movie itself reflected the time that the movie was being made, not when the movie took place. Correct. Bingo. Okay. Exactly. That's a good way to. I. I never. I never articulated it, but that. That's right. They're making a movie at that time in fifties and sixties about the past, but it. But its social conscience represented the moment. The moment. Yeah. And so they. They just. They. They flat out wrote um, African Americans out of the script. They now. They might be if there's a. a a bunch of wagons on a wagon trail or whatever, there might be a cook dressed in white cooking, cooking beans sure. over a campfire. Mr. Nightlinger, Mr. Nightlinger, Maybe. our favorite. Yeah. 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 It was very, it was very rare. And, and unfortunately, I mean, uh, it, it's really interesting. That, um, and I hope people take this the right way because, but it is true. It's very, very true. We look at John Wayne, like most people, when you think of cowboys and they want to envision the quintessential cowboy, for very many people, their, their vision 
is John, John Wayne. Wayne. That's yeah. what they saw. He's an actor playing a cowboy. So they can visualize an actor who played a cowboy being a cowboy, but they can't imagine a black man who was a cowboy and is a cowboy that he 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 is in fact not wearing a costume that that's who he is. He's a cowboy. Right. I put that out. We one of our questions on my pot on my Tuesday night deals was greatest fictional cowboy. Is that how we did it? TV, movie, or literature? We did it, you know. There was a couple of books. People referenced books. I, I, I'm going by what you say. We need to vi- we need to see it. Not enough of us like to read. There were some references to literature. Um, I did the cowboy Flint, Louis L'Amour. I, of course, I picked huh? that one. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, John Wayne, Will Anderson in the Cowboys. Uh, then there was McClintock and Rooster Cogburn. It was John Wayne. Was what they see as a cowboy. He was an actor playing a cowboy yeah 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 they they, it's it he and that and hey you know what i mean i'm i am not knocking my saying that part i'm not knocking john wayne because you know um he ought to probably be applauded that perhaps he's done more to promote unintentionally promote cowboys than any cowboy has done to promote cowboys um but he is an actor. He or he was an actor playing the part of a cowboy. Yeah. Um, and then we can get into the acting if you want. I mean, kind of, quite frankly, I mean, no pun intended. He was a one trick pony. <laughs> hey, I, I talked to a Clay O'Brien Cooper world champion who was in, he did, he was in the Cowboys. He was little Hardy Phipps in the Cowboys. And I interviewed him about that one time and asked him about his relationship with John Wayne as a, as a little boy. And he said he was a cowboy. Like, as far as horsemanship, things that he could do for those movies, that he was pretty good. Not bad. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. He really brought to light what it was like to be, what, it, what a cowboy was. He did. He did. And those movies did. And, and, and that was a real combination bet- between, between John Wayne and John Ford. So, I mean, it's the combination of those two Johns at that time yeah. that made those movies what they, what they are. I'll say this about the movies made in those times, the 50s, the 60s, 70s even. When I look at that, in those times, when those movies were made, I get it. I mean, I get why why they were made that way. Cause that was just the, the uh, climate of the country. I mean, don't you know what I'm saying? It, they made those movies from, and in that time they were made, they didn't have a lot of diversity, but that's just the time they were in. Right. I mean, I get what they were doing. It yeah. was inaccurate. It was inaccurate, but I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so the makeup of the cast was inaccurate. Right. You know, I don't want to, you know, you'd have to go movie by movie in terms of the accuracy of storylines, you know, because so when they always made it out to be Cowboys versus Indians, I mean, that that wasn't always that wasn't always the, 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 the case per se. You know, I mean, you can go to like the real story of Tombstone and even the movie Tombstone um, Cowboys. They were the outlaws. They were they were the mo- they were the hell's angels of the old west. Cowboy like the term cow like using cowboy. Um they were that they were the bad guys, you know. It was the good guys against the cowboys in um in Tombstone. You know, right. you had Wyatt Earp and the Earp brothers and those those bad guys were simply known as the the cowboys. They are the sundowners and the hell's angels and any of the other biker groups of the, I guess, 1960s and yeah. 70. It Am I inaccurate in, in saying something that I've heard that the term itself was a derogatory term because of the minorities, a cowboy? Because mm-hmm. is that inaccurate? That's inaccurate. Okay, because I have read that. that, that, that you're gonna, there's a lot of people who, 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 um, 
continue that. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I've talked to a, a number of different, I mean, the term cowboy goes all the way back to the, I mean, you can find uses of it in the 1700s. And, and so the whole notion of there were houseboys and cowboys and da, 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 oh, da right, you know, right. for the slaves working. Um, that's a very convenient, like when you hear that story told, you're like, wow. Makes sense. But like, something is that convenient, it's probably bullshit. Yeah. Right. It, 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 it fits too nice. Like look, people in our history, like when we look at even any, even things that are happening today or in the past life, just life is complex. It, it, it is not so simple that everything fits together like a, like a damn jigsaw puzzle, you right. know? Right. And, and when, when a story fits too nicely, you're like, uh, I don't know. There's there's some frayed edges there somewhere, and that that's that's one of those frayed edges. Um, that that's not that's not act. That's not you really. mean sort of like uh, tying a bull's nuts up to make him buck. It just keeps going right. on and on and on and on and. Nobody yeah. Whenever I have people who will <clears throat> say, "So that rope back there, wow, does does are they tying them up?" And I said, "Okay." Um, to one of my coworkers asked me that when she saw the PBR on uh, CBS the other week. And I said, okay, tonight when you're at home, tie your husbands up and, and see if he can do anything um, athletic <laughs> right. or any kind of movement. And she goes, oh, okay. But you guys are, you guys are, uh, you're giving them a jolt of electricity. And that's what gets them to Ken said, okay, so you want to tie your husband's balls up and electrocute him and think he's going to run circles around the house. <laughs> he's he's going to, he's so. going to become super athletic. Yeah. With doing no. that. yeah. He's going to lay whimpering on your living room floor. Yeah. I said, so there you go. You can take the tying the balls up and, and electrocuting them. And that's <laughs> wrapped up. Hey, we're going to, that's one, that's one clip right there. We solved the whole, whole I always, yeah. I always that's ask him, cut, right? What's that? You, you, that'll get cut from your podcast. No, not at all. Actually, <laughs> no. I always say, I always tell people, who do you think the guy is that crawls under there and does that? Like who, the lowest guy in the crew? Or I mean, what, who? <laughs> little, the, the PBR employs little people. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, when you talk about, I love the historical references. Like I said, that's my favorite. You, I, I saw you had, made a comment or in one of the articles, all of this history is available. I, I think that that intrigued me. It said it's there. It, it It's on Facebook. It's, it's out there for everyone to find. It's there, but so many people haven't found it. Be aware. Like it's amazing for me, the amount of people who are not aware of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. And so I, I document in the book more than a little over a hundred years worth of history. And I found damn near all of it on Facebook. Huh. I, I either found the black cowboys themselves, family or other cowboys who competed with them. Um, or just, just, I found them. All, I found, I, I located all of them using fake they're not on instagram they're not on twitter facebook. The, this this community they are facebook users and and you know um it's interesting like you know for the last four and a half years my my facebook page by and large has just been posts about black cowboys yeah and a couple people said man you're giving away your whole book and i said well if you find what i'm posting to be interesting Wait till you Wait see till. <laughs> what made the book because this is the shit that didn't make the book. Yeah. Um, Ty Murray, and then we'll we'll go back and forth here. Was it Ty Murray that introduced you to Murtis Deitman? Yeah. Yeah, he he he's the first person to ever tell me about Murtis. And then um, and then I met him and I had a uh, this incredible conversation with him. And I remember after my first talk with Murtis, I, I told Ty, I said, I don't know when, but I'm going to write that man's biography. And he was like, Oh yeah, really? You're going to, you're going to, that's a lot of work to write a, a whole book. 
And I, I said, I'm going to do it. And, and then, you know, you get busy with the PBR and, and then finally, you know, I have McBride telling me, you know, your next move, you got to be, you got to be an author. It's time to be an author, time to write a book, time to write a book. And I started to think about Murtis. And then at, the more I've talked to him, he would talk about other black cowboys, friends of his. So he would say, have you talked to Harold Cash? Who's Harold Cash? And he would tell me about Harold Cash. What about Freddie Gordon? What about Willie Thomas? What about Bailey's Prairie Kid? And I said, what? There's someone named, just the fact that his name is Bailey's Prairie Kid, I, I, need to, I need to talk to him. And he said, oh yeah, and he'll introduce you to his son, the Cold Duck Kid. And I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> and it, as soon as I heard about Bailey's Prairie Kid and the Cold Duck Kid, I knew then, as much as I want to write a book about Murtis Steitman, my book is going to be about black cowboys, not a black cowboy. Because if I only get to write one book and I only write about one man and, and I'm fortunate enough for people to read it, I didn't want to add to the perception that black cowboys were an anomaly. I wanted people to realize there was a wide range of black cowboys. And so <laughs> my book isn't a definitive work because I don't think a book can be definitive. You can't take a hundred years and put it all in five, in 400 pages, but it is a very comprehensive look at a century worth of black cowboys. And then, and then to narrow it down, I focused on black cowboys who had an impact on rodeo. Yeah. Um, is it Murtis? I think you've told me this often called the Jackie Robinson of rodeo. Cause he was yeah. the first one really visible. He, Probably should have been a world champion. Am I correct? In the times, I mean, it goes I, back and forth. Yeah, he was good enough. There's many, you know, there's, there's, there are, uh, just in bull riding, there's a shit ton of guys that were good enough to win a world title. They weren't black and they still didn't win. So right. he, yeah. he didn't win. So you can't actually say he absolutely would have, but. I will say when Murtis rode, they only used two judges and not four. So one bad judge screwing with the score was going to keep him from winning. But Murtis knew that. And so Murtis knew I have to somehow go to more events than everyone else. Because even if I don't get as many points as, as I feel I earned, if if I earn more qualified rides than everyone else, I'll make up that difference. Right. And and so that's how he in in 1967 finished third in the world. He just simply got on more bulls than everybody else. He went to more rodeos than everyone. In those times, in the part of the country where Murtis Deitman was riding, and from of yes, that happened. I mean, that's just reality in, again, yeah. the climate of the country, if he was down south, if he was in the south. I mean, it's reality, right? Yeah, it, it was reality. It was reality enough for him to say he never rode in Mississippi. He he rode in Louisiana, but mostly avoided Louisiana. Didn't, didn't hang in the south. Yeah. He knew, he was very, very smart. He knew that if he went to California, and he rode in ev all, all up and down the West Coast. Yeah, he went to every one of those. And then out on the East Coast, um, Cowtown, New Jersey. That's a that's a PRCA rodeo. That's a pro sure. rodeo, and it's every Saturday. And so he went he went and rode there quite a bit. And so and he knew he could go to the Midwest, Chicago, and Washington D.C. There were plenty of places for him to go, as well as the Texas rodeos and you know, Cheyenne and, and Calgary, or as he says, Calgary. Um, it, we, that's what people in Montana say too. It, it took me Calgary. years. Calgary. You got to go yeah. to Calgary to realize they say Calgary. Yeah. Yeah. So he knew how to like, for a guy who can't read and write and is illiterate, uh, dude knew how to manage a, a, a season. You know, we talk about that even in rodeo today, you got to know how to manage oh. a, a season in order to get to the, what's your goal? 
Right. And how do you, how do you break that down? And, and um, man, he's not a, he's, I just, I, I love the guy. I'm so fascinated by him. He doesn't man. read or write. He doesn't, doesn't read or write. No, when he first, when he first went on the road, um, he didn't know the difference between the $10 bill and a hundred dollar bill. He just wasn't going to let you know that he didn't know the difference. Hmm. Huh. The managing I've been around rodeo my whole life. And I've always said in, in pro rodeo, the world champions, not always, not always, uh, most of the time it is, but it's not always the best guy. It's the one that knows how to enter, knows how to travel, knows how to preserve himself. Hey, Cody Lambert entered Ty Murray in every rodeo he went to till Ty retired. Cody was retired and Ty talks about it. He had to worry about one thing, winning because he had people manage all that. And you have, and, and there's one other, one other qualifier. You, you've got to be consistent. You don't have to win every time mm-hmm. you, you got a place. You've got to, you've got to, you know, in rodeo, you've got to be winning money. You got to walk, you got to, you can't go somewhere. You can't afford to go anywhere and not win some money. Something. You got to, you got to walk away with some money. And then when you're, when you're on your game, when you're really on your game, you, you've got to know how to win. Yeah. You know, you, we mentioned earlier, like conversations I had with me, you've got to know how to put your foot on the throat of the opponent when the opportunity, like when, when they're laying there waiting for you to step on it, Step, step on it. On it. I, I've talked to ropers. Hey, man. They say, hey, not, you know, nice run. Yeah, I, I, I got third. I got fourth. And they said, you know what? If I win third or fourth every single weekend, I'll be the winner at the end. I just got to win money every time. You don't got to win every time. It's interesting to me. That's, uh, yeah. So uh, they, part of the title is from Harlem to Hollywood. There were all black rodeos up in New York, in Harlem. Correct. It- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the first one, and probably until this year, the most significant black rodeo in history took place September fourth, nineteen seventy one, in Harlem on Randall's Island at Downing Stadium, and um, there was a, a three mile long parade of black cowboys on horseback, led by Muhammad Ali, and. Um, that that was ten thousand. You know, it's reported that ten. I wasn't there. But there's reported ten thousand people were were in attendance. There's a documentary that a lot. You'll hear a lot of people talk about this documentary. Mm-hmm. You'll. I might be me and Andrew G. Angola from the PBR might be the only two people you know, Flint, who who's <laughs> actually seen the documentary. I think but, I think I've seen clips of it with music. Um, being, yeah. Yes. There are there are there are two. There are two clips on YouTube, but it's a 90 minute documentary. So most people haven't, they haven't really, um, they haven't seen it. It's a very much talked about. uh, It was very, uh, it was monumental. I mean, it was 1971. And at that time, you know, the Harlem Renaissance is clearly in the, in the past. It's over. The people of New York are realizing there is no regaining the Harlem Renaissance. And you're on the precipice of what becomes the crack epidemic. And it was a it was a time when when that neighborhood needed heroes, you know, and and I always say to this day, the only iconic heroic image that hasn't let us down is that of the American cowboy. Um, you know, people who are religious are, 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 are priests, you know, they've let us down. A lot of people have let, a lot of, lot of heroic things we look to and aspire, used to aspire to be, it, 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 it's no longer what it once was, right? right. But the, the one image, that iconic shadowy image of what is instantaneously a cowboy man it it still um it still is today what it's what we've always seen it to be you got to you talk about all the people you've met facebook and but on that it kind of that other end of the spectrum you talked about the guys you've never heard of 
with interesting names. Now I got to write a book. But on the other end, now you got guys that are fans of you. Right? The foreword of your book, Danny Glover, correct? Lethal Weapon. Yeah. I taught Jim Pickens from uh, that's on Grey's Anatomy. He and I discussed your book. Uh, actors, how the hell did you get Danny Glover to write the foreword? How yeah. did, how'd you pull that? Diablo, how'd you pull that off, man? Facebook. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Facebook. I, uh, on Facebook, I met, I met Reginald T Dorsey and he's one of the, he's another one of the black cowboys who happens to be an actor. Yes. He's not an actor who just simply played a black cowboy. He's a black cowboy from Dallas who now lives in Hollywood. He was on the original 21 jump street. Um, he was on the return to lonesome dove. He's he, and, hey, he's one of those guys that you see because did i see him in vegas last summer and he's one of those guys that you go i don't know his name but that guy's in everything like you see him all the time right exactly okay exactly and um i met reginald on facebook i friended him he friend and he accepted and we exchanged uh messages i told him about my book he started to scroll around on my page and, and this is right before, right as the pandemic was starting. Mm-hmm. And we ended up getting on the phone and he said, well, not only do you need to write about, not that I needed to write about him, he said, but if you're gonna write about me, you need to write about Oba Baba Tunde, you need to write about Glenn Turman, you need mm-hmm. to write about James Pickens Jr. And I said, that would be great. I don't know how to get a hold of Oba, Regin, uh, Glenn, or James. And he said, they're my friends. I'm, I'm going to set this up for you. And so in a matter of a couple of weeks, I ended up interviewing Oba, Glenn, and, and uh, James. And Glenn is, I mean, Oba and Glenn both are, are uh, Emmy winners. Yeah. And uh, Glenn is now, um, he and his granddaughter are featured in the in the Beyonce video for her new clothing line, um, Ivy Park with Adidas, that's inspired by the history of black cowboys. And then James, of course, you've interviewed him. I think your listeners have listened to him and are familiar that for like 18 years, he's been on Grey's Anatomy yeah. as Dr. Dr. Web, Dr. Weber. And so I interviewed those guys. And then I interviewed Reginald and they're in, they each have a chapter in the book. And then um, in June of 2020 on a Friday night, I can't go anywhere. All the shit's closed. I'm on the <laughs> phone with Reginald and, um, and I'm telling him like, man, I need, I need a name. I need somebody with my forward. And I started saying, you know, I know that, It's probably not likely, but I rattled off some names. And he said, well, I tell you what, if, if, uh, if you wanted Danny, I can, I can reach out. And I was like, Danny, cause I had said Danny Glover and the way he just said, if you want, I can call like Danny who, and he goes, well, Danny Glover. And, um, and so while we were on the phone talking, he sent Danny a text and then 45 minutes later, literally 45 minutes later, Danny texts back, let's do this. Have him get in touch with me. No kid. And then that Monday I got in touch and, um, and he, he agreed and, and then uh, wrote the, wrote the forward. And part of it was he wrote the forward and part of it was what I read when you, when everyone else reads what he wrote, they're going to understand. But um you know, I, I know, I know cowboys aren't supposed to cry. I'm not a cowboy. So I so cried, you cried yeah. twice and, um, and it was pretty, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful what he wrote and it, and, and you know that he read my book because he perfectly sets up where my book begins. It, it, I mean, it, it, it I just, a lot of times when you see a, a, a name like that, that's written a foreword, it's really to get the name on the cover. It, right. it doesn't hurt. I'm telling you, but, um, 
but it really yeah. if it, the forward serves a purpose when when and if your your listeners um read uh read the book he it it he knocked so it out of the park. it's heartfelt you know you know yeah. when you read what a, a really big star like danny glover wrote it would make you cry because this is a, a major star movie and tv star and he you knew when he wrote that he truly felt what you were trying to portray and, and it came from the heart that that would make me cry too i mean yeah 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 and, and 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 he had done a lot of i mean not just for this he had and the reason he said yeah he's done a lot of his a lot of a lot of research and history already yeah. um and it is um it's something that he's very passionate about <sighs> overwhelming do it this book it's been a lot of years i mean you've been working on this for a long time did you at times just go oh my god how do i or did it was it was the process good enough that it kept you stimulated? Kept there were two moments where, where, um, where I needed to, if, if, if the project was a car, I needed to take it in for a tune up. Um, one time came when I was interacting with some potential agents and I had an agent get back in touch with me and, um, and, uh, and they, it was, they, they said, you know, you have a really good subject. You have a great subject. And on the subject alone, you'll probably sell your book. And though it's sometimes difficult for people to hear this, they need someone other than a friend to give them feedback and to tell you, you're just not publishable. <sighs> but it, man, no. I, by that, you know, I've written... 10,000 or more articles or whatever. I, I know I can write. Yeah. And I know there have been people who don't like the topics that I maybe write about, or they don't like my viewpoint of it or my take. But man, I had never had someone just out and out flat tell me, you are not publishable. Huh. And, and it, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. It's, it fucking pu it, it 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 paralyzed me for four months. Huh. Yeah. Well, what do you do then? Go to somebody. Do you go to somebody else? What What do you do? Is that suffer? <laughs> <laughs> uh. So uh, it was tough. Hmm. It was. It was. I mean, and I had people who I really trust that are writers and whatever. Like that that tried to talk sense into me and I and I knew it and I knew I myself I didn't need them to tell like I knew um but it it was um it was it was a little it was a little bruising man it it, yeah. it uh I mean flat out it it, it hurt yeah um well, see, well, when you're writing, I would think, you know, you've spent all these years on it. If you're writing a novel, kicking out novels like James Patterson, and the story can go where you want it to go and where you think it will take someone that they stay hooked yeah, and buy the next book. The story is good enough. You are not. Right, right. right. He was saying your topic it's great. is going to get published it's in you. spite of your <laughs> ability, inability. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was, it was, it was bruising. And then there was one time where, you know, um, I spent three years flying around and re research and interviewing and writing. And then there was another year after I turn it in before it comes out. So it, there's a four year, it's three and a half and then a year. Mm -hmm. So in that three and a half years, there was also one window where even I said to myself, you've got to talk about something other than black cowboy. Like I, people like I wondered, there have to be people who are avoiding me because the last thing they want to hear is, Hey, there's a new black cowboy. I met, you're not going to believe what their story is. <laughs> and so for my, my own sanity, I, um, I spent one spring traveling around um, to prisons, interviewing people for a, uh, an eventual book um, 
about the history of prison rodeos. Ah. And I did that for, for three or four months just to see, I know there, I know there's a history. I know there's a story, but can you get it? Like, can you get those people to talk? Can you find them? You right. know? Right. And, um, and so I spent three or four months and I was almost getting lulled into, holy shit, I'm going with, I'm like, and I knew I needed to put that to the side and get back to the black, yeah the black cowboys, you know, well, when you now, now that's on the way back burner. Yeah. Well, when you're, when your prison rodeo one comes out, we'll have you on. Again. Yeah. <laughs> one of my, well, before that, it, there's going to be, um, I'm for, it's unfortunate for them. The, uh, the, uh, it's called cowboys and inmates. That's the working title. Nice. Um, nice. Uh, but, uh, anyway, there'll be a companion piece about cowgirls obviously i because this one's all about cowboys sure and then um and then i'm probably a third of the way done with one on the emergence of black stuntmen in hollywood Mm. nice from your world i I know you had a world of you you mentioned that the swedish rock man that wasn't abba um you toured in the (laughs) the rock world what did you know about PBR and Cowboys in general when you started at the PBR? What did you know? What would be yeah, your scale? For eight seconds. Eight, eight seconds. That was it. That's that's all. Didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't, uh, I, didn't know any, I didn't know anything. And in fact, in my interview, my interview with the PBR only lasted 10 minutes. And, um, and I remember Sean Gleason asking me, what do you know about our sport? And my aunt, I took a deep breath and um, my answer was, I could sit here right now and, and regurgitate all the things that I've Googled in the last 48 hours in anticipation of this conversation, but you're going to know that I'm simply telling you shit that I Googled in the past 48 hours. And I might actually use the words wrong. Yeah. Figure, fi- figuratively, your hat wasn't shaped right. That, Correct. Fi- you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> but one thing I did read is that you guys are trying to become the fastest growing sport and you want to reach a mass audience. I said, I write about people and whether those people are in a band, in a movie or architects or bull riders, what they do is the canvas behind them. The human being is up front and I'm writing about human beings. And I, I don't know. They, 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 they like my bullshit and they hired me. (laughs) And they, yeah. Okay. Through your years. And then uh, I won't keep you much longer, but through your years of writing with PBR, you're friends with Ty and McBride, all those guys kind of friends with Adriano too, even though he called you. We are. Yeah. Yeah in your years of PBR till the time you stopped and even looking right now, the, who is the most unique? We talked about Brett Favre, you know, and we, uh, Justin McBride unique, but a standout personality, um, somebody that I call it good for business in the PBR, the guy that got the most interest in what you wrote, who would you think it was? Well, I mean, our good for business guy when I was at JB Mooney. JB Mooney. Yeah, by the right. way, by the way, smart ass, all your messages. Hey, where's JB? I get it. Yeah. I, I thought you would say, does that, uh, here's what I've said. It, it, it may agree or don't disagree. I've said the JB Mooney thing is because of what you said a couple minutes ago. That one thing that hasn't let us down is that image of the cowboy. JB's got a, the silhouette of JB is a cigarette in his mouth, having a beer. He's always got his cowboy hat on. He's never in flip flops. He's always in his Wranglers. I think he's the quintessential cowboy to people who maybe are clinging and looking for that. Well, yeah. And here's, here's the deal where he doesn't let you down. I mean, um, he's, he wants, he wants, he wants whatever the, the, the rankest bull is in the pen more times than not, he comes through. Um, 
when you when the event needs man you know what it's like you're the one who's got to pick that audience up when it's when the whole vibe is flat man jb can help completely like he can he can he can lift the i don't mean to romanticize it or make him more of a hero than he is but man he can lift the environment the feel the atmosphere just the song just bad yeah. to the bone the first two bars of the song e- lifts it up everything about it you know the, the even even him being the cowboy with the black hat and i remember in 2008 Randy Bernard was still there and we like I went to one of my first meetings and he was like yeah I want these ads and he wanted them designed and he's like I want you to make sure you're using photographs of JB with a black hat and I want Lostro in a white hat and those are the pictures we're going to use the whole year and he 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 like everything was clicking um no one ever told me a story that I had to write I just knew like they were battling it out, you know, in 2008, a uh, Galermi runs away with it, but 2009 was a hell of a battle. And, um, it, it just, he's, he, you, you say, you use the term all the time. Good for business. He's, yeah. he's great for business. He's really, yeah. Now he's good he's for not even in the PBR and he's still, still good, good for, for bit. I've said pro I'm, I'm happy. He's, you know, the way as he's gotten older, Rodeo fits him now and he likes rodeo. And I say to pro rodeo, you're welcome from the PBR uh, in a sense. Yeah. PBR built, he built his image, but it was on, t- the thing was, it was on TV every week too. And that doesn't happen in rodeo. So he, he got built in the PBR and went over to rodeo and they're, they're doing it too. Wait till the NFR. He'll be the most popular cowboy at the NFR. Yeah. Oh, and you, you know, like, cause we were both commenting that when they, when they started those reports on uh, the, the tablet <laughs> and whatnot, like, yes. oh, it could be season <sighs> ending. It's like, uh, do, do you yeah. know who you're talking about? It's, it, oh, yeah. Um. The, the middle of September, JB yeah. Mooney has a lacerated kidney, NFR in jeopardy. Bullshit. <laughs> I called him. I called him. He goes, oh my God, no way. Okay, one time he had an injury that literally the only thing holding his arm on his body was the skin. The skin, yeah. And everything else was broke apart. Like, bones broke, the ligament, anything in the shoulder, it was all torn. The skin was holding his arm on, and he still went, <laughs> never missed. <laughs> never I was missed. Going to find him. No. I know. I was there. Not that that was his, the light or the brightest. That was his Calgary injury, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I was there. That was a bad one. And he was trying to get on. He was checking to get on the next day in Calgary. He didn't know. I'm going to see you about tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, um, listen, I, I want to reiterate to everybody, Black Cowboys of Rodeo, hold up your tight, hold up your book, Keith. Black Cowboys of Rodeo, Unsung Heroes from Harlem to Hollywood and the American West. By the way, I'm texting you my address so you can send me one. Okay. Can you do that? Or do, it. do I got to buy one? Right. No, no. I, a hard, this is a paperback version, but I'll, you'll get the hard copy. Yeah, and I want put something nice in there for me. Could you like, you know, Flint, my good friend, whatever. Yeah, something. Got, make something up. I got. Make I got something. to take care of. No worries. <laughs> well, listen. Um, it, it, this may sound cliche. If your book keeps me glued, like the interview you just did with me, I'm sold, man. Cause I, I love the history of this. It's a, uh, and even though, you know, we've been around each other a long time and I don't know if I can say this as kind of equals and friends, but I'm proud of you for this. This Thank is a, uh, I watch you. You, I remember you coming to stay at my house with my family. We drove to Billings. You stopped and took pictures and you did a long form story on me and my journey. And it was amazing. And so I'm, I'm with McBride. You needed to write a book. And so we're, we're proud of you, buddy. Thank you. It means yeah. a lot. I'm a, I want, I want to, I want to say something that I, I've only recently come to, uh, to, to realize, you know, I, I've had a very background. I, I feel like it, there's been a linear line to my career. Um, but I've 
been in a in and around many different things, whether it's rock and roll, the movie industry, TV stuff, the the PBR, education, whatever. Um, but when you one thing I've learned, and it is not this way in all the other areas, when you make a friend with cowboys, you made a friend. And and so I feel like I'm as close to the people that I was friends with when I was going to PBRs every week. I'm, I'm as much a friend with them uh, today yeah. as I was then. I mean, we don't talk, you know, you've referenced, like we don't get to talk every, uh, all the time, right? You're traveling, you're doing your thing. I'm doing, doing mine, but, but when we do it, it picks up just like it did. Yeah. Always how, the last time. Yeah. And I don't, I've only recently come to realize that it is, it, this, that is unique to the cowboy culture. And, and I, um, and I appreciate that because I'm not a cowboy and I got, I got, I got accepted. Completely. Yep. I, I agree. And I agree on the friendship thing with cowboys completely hundred percent. Yeah. Hey buddy, thanks for taking an hour out of your day. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Really. I appreciate it. You betcha.